My name is Carlos. I'm a robot operator. I started out in sanitation. What I would tell those uh, that are interested in, in working for National Beef, sky's the limit here. People are friendly. If you're a go-getter, you're going to accomplish it. And this is the place to do it. Looking for a job with an opportunity to grow? See Carlos' story and apply now at nationalbeef.com slash careers or call us at 419-257-5535. Warning, if you're looking for a profanity-free podcast, you're in the wrong place, motherfucker. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the damn near heroic effort I made to stop playing Starfield before 4 a.m. last night. You're welcome. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hey, this is Jordan from Canada. Yeah, that one. I've been reading the wonderful book, Ralph the Flying Hedgehog and the Magical Red Rain Jacket, now available online. And after flying all over the world searching for that rain jacket, Ralph can assure you that humans did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey people. You can do it, Ralph! It's September 14th, and it's the exaltation of the cross. Okay, I feel like Jesus is going to have an issue with that if he ever gets back, right? Right. <laughs> I have no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. Um, he's Henright. And from Chris Christie's, New Jersey, ooh, ooh. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, CPAC attendees do their first exercise in a long time. Nice. Mike Lindell drives a Dodge Stratus. <laughs> And the Old Testament will enter the yada, yada, yada phase. But first, the diatribe. On Skeptocrat this week, Keith talked about how awkward it must be for people who have birthdays on September 11th. And it only occurred to me later that we kind of have one of those ourselves. And not we as in this show or anything like that, but we as in the atheist movement, right? Many people credit the 9-11 terrorist attacks as the event that first started to shake society out of its religious coddling stupor and forced it to reckon with the true dangers of religious devotion. Now, I would argue that this atheist movement was an inevitable outgrowth of the internet's growing ubiquity around the same time. But regardless, 9-11 marked an important step in the movement's growth, even if only from a rhetorical perspective, which means that by a lot of people's reckoning, the new atheist movement turned 22 years old this week. Of course, the term new atheism has fallen out of favor along the way, and, and good thing too, right? Nothing 22 years old or older should still be called new, I'm looking at you, York and Jersey. Over the last couple of decades, it swelled and it split and it swelled and it split. It's rejected its heroes. It's taken new heroes. It's rejected those heroes, too. It's been declared dead more times than Freddy and Jason combined, but it's still here. And it's plenty old enough to have a drink at this point, which is a good thing because it sure as fuck needs a drink at this point. Right. I, it's, I feel like a lot of people sort of lost track of that lesson that seems so obvious in the wake of 9-11. And to be fair, a lot of you motherfuckers weren't even born then, and even a lot of people Eli's age didn't have a lot of knowledge of the wider political landscape at the time. And over the years, the focus of 9-11 has shifted away from the dangers of religious extremism that caused it in favor of focusing on the nationalist extremism that it caused. Now, clearly, there were a lot of geopolitical forces at play on September 11th of 2001. So to a lot of people, it seems simplistic and even bigoted to reduce the attacks down to religion did it. Right. Some would argue that blaming religion for 9-11 would be little better than blaming airplanes or box cutters. Religion was simply a tool that the terrorists used to accomplish their attack. Hell, those people would probably even say misused instead of used, as though religions came with a list of intended uses from their manufacturers. But in the words of both Cicero and Eli trying to hire an Italian sex worker, qui bono? Who benefits? Right, right like the ostensible political goals of 9-11 were to get the U.S. to remove military personnel from Saudi Arabia. It had the exact opposite effect, and it could only have ever had the exact opposite effect. 
right? Those attacks had every bit as much likelihood of removing American military bases from Saudi Arabia as they had of sending those hijackers to fucking paradise. And yet people act as though the political goals are somehow more real than the religious ones simply because they're secular, right? They, they say that the religious goals were just a cloak to trick religious zealots into carrying out political goals. But it would be far more accurate to say that the political goals were a cloak to trick political zealots into funding religious goals. Now, you might be inclined to say that the 9-11 attacks harmed the Muslim faith by turning people against it in places like the U.S. and Europe. But as American Christianity's illusion of persecution is happy to attest, few things are better at turning religious people inward than rejection from the outside. Right? Religious people certainly benefit from religious tolerance, but it makes religious institutions wither. I don't say that to blame religious minorities for their own persecution, right? That's not fair. But I say it to emphasize the fact that the goals of religious leaders and those of their followers pretty much never line up. And of course, our secular nation is still under attack by religious zealots. They're using the courts more than violence these days. But to be clear, they're still using plenty of fucking violence, right? Both before and after 9-11, Americans faced far more physical danger from Christian terrorists than those of any other flavor or all other flavors combined. But the dangers of their murderous rampages pale in comparison to the shit that they're doing to our laws. And once again, the religious goals are hiding behind political goals, hiding behind religious goals. Religious groups are literally training armies to take over the government and install theocratic leadership. And our society, by and large, carries on as though the religions are just, you know, poor, ignorant rubes being tricked into working against their own best interest by cynical politicians and their political goals. They assume that religion is the hammer rather than the hand. But there's at least some good news to wrap around all of this shit as we contemplate the last couple of decades of activism, because as big as the losses we've taken both legislatively and judicially are, the strides we've taken culturally might be even bigger. Right. Like the word atheism might not pull as well as it used to, but the benefits and need for secularism and for secular activism have never been more clear to more people. The number of people rejecting church and rejecting faith has never been higher in this country or in this world. Hell, the number of people calling themselves atheists has never been higher. Because whenever we're in danger of losing sight of why we were here in the first place, religion is happy to remind us of all the terrible shit that happens when faith crashes into your institutions with a full tank of gas and a full head of steam. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the hand-tossed and deep dish to my thin and crispy heat then right and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to fight over who has to be deep dish? Okay, is deep dish even allowed after Roe got overturned? Are you? To do that? <laughs> I mean, look, if I've learned anything from seven years of marriage and Pequod's pizza, it's that hand tossed is way faster. Right. Thank you. <laughs> faster. In our lead story tonight, the entire landscape of the federal judiciary at this point in history is best described as secular Americans losing a game of pretend to Christians. And when you think about it like that, it's obvious why, right? They're, they're better at fucking pretend. They, they practice constantly, which is why when they throw up pretend court cases, like the one where an assistant football coach pretended his prayers were private and non-coercive, pretended he got fired for him and pretended he wanted his job back, the court's theocratic majority has no trouble pretending they believe him, even when the court's minority provides photographic evidence to the contrary and ordering the school to rehire him. Well, Last week, the bullshit edifice of that entire case came crashing down without consequence when said coach quit said job after a single game. Yeah, because fuck those kids. It's not right? about them, the kids. It's about you, coach. Exactly. It's about you. Good decision. Of course, this is the story of Joe Kennedy, the assistant football coach in Washington State who held giant prayer circles at the 50-yard line after public high school football games, urging the participation of his players to the point where several of them said they felt coerced. He was placed on paid leave when he refused to abide by repeated requests to keep his prayers to himself. Then his contract wasn't renewed. Then he moved to Florida, the furthest possible state within the contiguous U.S. from where he was, and sued and said he wanted that job back. Yeah, speaking of which, I heard George Soros was suing Germany to get back his lamp-making gig, too. Oh, like, similar, similar <laughs> idea. It's that bad for Joe Kennedy. It's like yeah. the Holocaust. Well, he's like Mr. Holland's opus. You know, if he can change just one kid's constitutionally protected rights against religious coercion. It'll all yeah. have been worth it. Right, right. But Americans United for Separation of Church and State, who represented the school district in the case, argued that this move should render the case moot 
since, you know, he's not going to sell his fucking home and move 2,800 miles to take a $5,300 a year assistant coaching job. Kennedy's lawyers responded, of course, by playing fucking pretend. They filed a response that said Kennedy was, quote, champing at the bit to, quote, resume the job he loves, end quote. Kennedy himself attested, quote, I am ready and willing to resume my coaching duties in Bremerton, Washington. I can do so within 24 hours of reinstatement if I am still temporarily residing in Florida, end quote. Jesus is my co-pilot and my offensive coordinator. I'll be there so fast. Yeah. Ready to Listen, go. Y'all, do you know how expensive Airbnb has gotten? Buying a house down here was just way easier. I'm totally <laughs> coming back. Now, of course, Kennedy did resume the job, but with zero intent of actually keeping it for the season. In the meantime, he's become a cause celeb of the Christian right. He makes his money doing fucking paid speaking gigs and selling his bullshit story to be even further fictionalized via a ghost written book that comes out next month and a goddamn pure flicks movie coming to a gam episode in the near future. Damn it. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, <laughs> but and to the extent that he returned to the school at all, it was to provide a dramatic close for those properties. Hell, the motherfucker never even moved back to Washington. He just crashed at a friend's place for the week and a half or whatever that he was ostensibly working there. Honey, he's just staying until he can get theocracy back on his feet. Let's be yeah, right. patient. And in CPAC spotty spray news, nice. fantastic. according to a new report by the Daily Beast, the Christian right lunatics in charge of the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, have been doing regular exorcisms of their headquarters in Washington, D.C. And not like chill, relaxed exorcisms, quick blessing. They've been paying for an extended campaign of anti-demon magic performed by specially trained Catholic priests who go through the offices, wrangling the demons, of course, installing magical amulets, and spraying the employees with holy water. Jesus CPAC body spray. Yeah. Oh, they get done. They check the evilometer again. It's still off the charts. They're like, damn, I guess we're going to have to try to exercise these <laughs> demons again. There must be some really evil demons hiding in here somewhere. Damn. My favorite part about this story is that CPAC is largely run by cynical non-believers. So you know Every time these loons visit, they have to be like, oh, good, you're back again. Love it. <laughs> I love yeah. taking this seriously. <laughs> yeah, those people actually quit pinning that. So yeah. <laughs> big thanks to Jacqueline for the story. Scathingnews at gmail.com if you want to help out. Whoa, 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 Heath. Are you telling me that our listeners can not only send us atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com, but if they do, we can guarantee zero demons in their workplace for a calendar year? Hmm. I mean, I mean, yeah, we can guarantee that. Yeah. yeah. I guess so. Whether or not they do that, we can guarantee that. So, yeah, right. <laughs> the person in charge of this whole thing is Matt Schlapp. He's the chairman of the American Conservative Union, which is the parent organization that runs the CPAC events, lobbies for Christian right theocracy in general. And, of course, promotes homophobia. That's three ways of saying the same thing. Yeah, a lot of crossover there. He's also the former co-chair of Catholics for Trump. And he's also been accused of sexual assault by a bunch of men. That includes a former staff member of the Herschel Walker campaign who said that Schlapp, quote, grabbed my junk and pummeled it at length. Pummel. End quote. At length seems a bit braggy, no? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's probably the wrong Take away. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised he's not having the exorcist look for whoever molested his staff. That seems to be the thing <laughs> yeah, to look into. Be a good use of any sort of investigation around there. Mm -hmm. So sure. the exorcism campaign started last year after that pin, that group of employees resigned in protest. Match Lap immediately picked up his like big red phone, called a Ghostbuster priest who showed up very quickly and sprayed holy water everywhere, including on people, regardless of their faith. The priest also put up a security system of medallions, which are still in place today. The medallions are the St. Benedict's Medal, a series of those, because that's the patron saint of exorcism. Apparently, the exorcisms and the medallion arrays don't always work right away. If you really want to get rid of those demons, the best bet is the subscription service that gets you regular visits from those expert priests and Apparently, that's what Matt Schlapp did. The exorcisms are ongoing and often involve entire rooms being shut down because of magical safety concerns. And the staff is doing its best to help 
the priests find the source of the evil. According to one of the team members, quote, as the priest made his way through the office, spritzing holy water room to room, employees nudged him towards Matt's office. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and hey, if the holy water doesn't melt him wicked witch style, try to get him to say his name backwards and see if that works. <laughs> <laughs> guys, guys, who put a trail of M&Ms and gay porn leading to my office? This is serious, okay? <laughs> so in response to the story about the exorcism and the news about the latest allegations of sexual assault, the Schlapps are claiming the Daily Beast is the real enemy and is being secretly run by Satan, the Prince of Darkness himself. Apparently, <laughs> the name Beast is a double bluff mm. in their title. Mm. According to Matt's wife, Mercedes Schlapp, quote, Americans are dying of fentanyl, children are being sex trafficked, and violent crimes are happening in our cities while Satan's publication is writing about exorcisms. Daily Beast is a joke, end quote. Well, okay, but, but you're doing them. <laughs> right, like, you see how the what a trivial thing to think about in light of real problems defense loops back around on you here, right, Mercedes? <laughs> it's the you filming me getting a Charlie horse trying to suck my own dick that it's embarrassing. Okay? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Shame <laughs> on you. Heisenberg situation. Absolutely. <laughs> and according to Matt Schlapp, quote, we're being terrorized by a demon self-described as the Daily Beast. The good news is the leadership of CPAC knows how the epic battle against the beast ends. I'd short the stock, end quote. So just to be clear, he's going to short the stock of the Daily Beast. You can't do that. It has a parent organization. That you're <laughs> no, it's, it was, it's 143rd of yeah, this Yeah, it's, it's nothing. You, you cannot do that. <laughs> but he thinks he's going to short their stock so that he can make some big money on the stock market at the apocalypse when Sword Mouth Jesus <laughs> yeah, I'm shows up and then <laughs> beats up the beast and the fucking other Kraken beast and throws him in the lake of fire. And then he's going to be like, buy that stock back at a profit. Nailed it. Exactly. <laughs> and in 666 in the head news. I try not to talk a lot about my son on this show. He's only three he might not always want his Google results to be that closely associated with his dad. And, well, some stuff is better left off the air. But this week is rather special for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, this week, Max received his autism diagnosis from a developmental pediatrician. Now, don't get me wrong, we saw this coming for a while. I mean, anybody who's ever seen my son watch a marble run on YouTube saw this coming for a while. And, of course, it doesn't change how proud we are of him or how much we love him one little bit. I can't imagine feeling otherwise. And I also can't imagine how it must have felt to be a parent like me who sat in the congregation of Pastor Rick Morrow of Ballula Church in Richland, Missouri, when he announced this week that not only was autism caused by the devil, okay. but that prayers could cure it. <sighs> Great. Lots of big theories about sinister plans to create more autism in the world. And they all end with like, Autism now. And now, um, I was done. I just, that was like the whole thing. Yeah. What's the end game for Satan there right. with a bunch more autism? What is he trying to monetize his marble run YouTube channel? What I is mean, the point? He, if he is, he's nailing it. Can I say he is absolutely, he's nailing it in the Bosnick household. So here's the quote. And you'll excuse me, it's a little long, but there's just so much delicious, stupid packed into this paragraph. Quote Let's talk about autism. Rick. Did you just go there? Yeah. Like, I know a minister who has seen lots of kids that are autistic, that he cast the demon out, and they were healed. Ugh. And then he had to pray, and their brain was rewired, and they were fixed. Jesus. So the implication that autism is a demon wasn't the most offensive part of the sentence. No. It was <laughs> Jesus. I guess congratulations are in uh -huh. order. Is it impressive somehow? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think he's lying, though. I think he's lying. <laughs> it might not be true. I think he's a liar. Grain of salt, everybody. Grain of salt. Yeah. He continues, quote, if it's not demonic, then we have to say God made them that way. Like, that's the only other explanation. Why does my kid have autism? Well, either the devils attacked them. He's brought this infirmity upon them. He's got them where he wants them. And or... 
God just doesn't like him very much, and he's made him that way. Okay, Whoa. I like that he's using singular they, them. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, here you go. Ready for this? Well, real quote again. Well, my God doesn't make junk. Oh. God doesn't make mess ups. God doesn't make people that way. So let's quit being nice and putting a Band-Aid on stuff and giving it medicine. And quote. Quit giving it medicine? <laughs> okay, God doesn't make autism, but he makes a supremely evil goat demon who does make autism? Do you fucking yeah. hear yourself? <laughs> right, right. So I'm sorry, if your God doesn't make junk, where the fuck did you come from, dick? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's true. But it does actually get worse. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> hear, hear me out. Several parishioners have since reached out to Morrow, and he has done nothing but double down. And we're still, Shocking. Morrow isn't just some harmless preacher. He's a member of his local school board. <sighs> Yikes. The guy who just called autistic people mess ups is making decisions about education at a district level. And look, I've always thought this kind of thing is terrible, right? We've got a lot of listeners on the spectrum who have told us just how badly religion handled their condition. Some of them were subjected to fucking exorcisms because of bullshit like this. But there's one place that Morrow and I actually agree. Because if I ever see the guy who called my kid junk... I promise you, I'm going to quit being nice right then and there. Mm, all right. Well, I feel like Eli's about to threaten violence, and I don't know that I can bring myself to dissuade him this time. So instead, <laughs> I'm going to hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucin. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Okay, so I actually have a bit of good news to open up with this week. And if your first thought when I said that was, well, then it must be international news, give yourself a gold star. Because this story is coming to us from Mexico, where the Supreme Court negated all federal criminal penalties for abortion last week. The ruling, rightly, declares those laws unconstitutional since they violate a pregnant person's right to themselves. Pretty fundamental when it comes to rights, really. It's worth noting, too, that abortion isn't the only fundamental human right Mexico is better at recognizing than America. See, Mexican citizens enjoy a right to health care, which means that their government is now required to provide abortion services to anybody who asks for them. Now, to be clear, there are still state laws prohibiting abortion in 20 of Mexico's 32 states. And while the Supreme Court is supreme, it'll apparently take a while to legally untangle all the implications of this and make abortion access truly universal in the country. But that is where they are headed. That is the exact opposite of where we're heading. But enough about good news. It's time to talk about religion a phenomenon that invariably leads to misogyny, regardless of the specifics of the faith. Because a religion begets power, and power, at least in the hands of men, invariably begets misogyny. Now allow me to add and dismiss the problematic not-all-men caveat on behalf of some wincing listeners. Because, of course, some men can have power and not use it to abuse women. And there are definitely ways of organizing power structures that protect people from abuse regardless of who holds that power. But that's not what religion does. It concentrates power in a small group, it establishes rigid hierarchies, and it diminishes accountability. And that is always a recipe for abuse. Case in point, the 30-year sentence just handed down to Danny Masterson of that 70s show fame. And kudos to the judge in that case, by the way, for giving him what I believe is the maximum possible sentence here, and not even asking about his swim times. But as you'll know, if you've followed this case on even a glancing at the headlines kind of way, this is just another story of religion empowering an abuser, then protecting that abuser with all the weight of their church. In this case, it was the Church of Scientology. But other than that, the story played out exactly the same way it always does. And speaking of empowering rapists, can I just take a second to say fuck Ashton Kutcher, Mila Kunis, Kurtwood Smith, Deborah Jo Rupp, Billy Baldwin, Giovanni Ribisi, and every other motherfucker in Hollywood who wrote this judge a letter asking for leniency for Masterson. You might have seen the stories about Kutcher and Kunis, co-stars of his on that 70s show, apologizing for the letters and assuring everyone that they'd never have written them if they knew they'd be made public. But to be clear, a bunch of motherfuckers wrote these glowing letters of praise for him 
after he was convicted of drugging and violently raping two women. So, no. Sorry, Ashton. Sorry, Mila. As much as I'd love to say that it doesn't matter because the court summarily dismisses the opinions of people who publicly brag about how infrequently they bathe, that's not the case. Letters like this matter. And the fact that y'all motherfuckers chose to rally around the rapist instead of the victims isn't something society should forgive you for. And with that off my chest, I suppose I can hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And into speech his own news. According to a recent survey, America's Christians are significantly more committed to the free expression of ideas than its atheists. And in fact, the more Christian one's religious bent, the more committed one tends to be of said exchange. A statement so patently false, it feels like it should be followed up with me asking Heath how bullshit it is in a deep (laughs) echoey voice. Uh, But according to the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression or FIRE or an entirely conservative funded bullshit organization designed to battle wokeness on campus, Mormons, Catholics and Orthodox Christians are almost twice as likely to tolerate opposing viewpoints as atheists. What? I mean... Noah, there are dozens of rights they haven't taken away from us yet. What more do you need? (laughs) But just for context, a fundamental tenet of Christianity is that people who don't embrace that worldview are going to be tormented in a lake of fire for all eternity. Yes. The God of their universe is literally infinitely intolerant of opposing (laughs) viewpoints. You couldn't be more intolerant. (laughs) Those people are being tolerant to the extent that they're being not Christian. Also, the survey is garbage, but like, yes. come on. That too. Yes, right. This, this bullshit result is based on a single question. So FIRE asked 55,000 students how acceptable it would be to protest campus speakers by shouting them down. When asked, 45% of Protestants, 44% of Mormons, and 42% of Catholics said it would never be acceptable, while only 24% of atheists did. Yes, and we are willing to speak on every one of those Protestant, Mormon, and Catholic campuses to prove them wrong. Right. I'll happily do like a good universe Steven Crowder table. Just like, religion is intolerant. Prove me right. Side tackle. (laughs) (laughs) And we did it. We did it, everybody. But of course, the fundamental flaw at the heart of this survey is the assumption that both the left and right are saying equally shitty stuff, Right. Because the left doesn't really have a Charlie Kirk or a Milo Yiannopoulos. And to the extent that we do, we're not inviting them to speak on college fucking campuses. Wish you would. I'd bring hats and have a prop. <laughs> you should see how he dress. Milkshakes. Shenanigans. But the people being shouted down, though, as near as I can tell, are exclusively people who are actively opposing the civil rights of other groups. It's a loaded fucking question. Right. Like if you ask people on the right and people on the left, if it was ever acceptable to protest and shout at people walking into a medical clinic for a medical procedure, it would be disingenuous as hell to then present the results as evidence that conservatives are against health more than liberals. That's exactly (laughs) what this bullshit survey is doing. Yeah. I mean, you'd be right. The conservatives are against health, but you'd be proving it wrong. And also worth noting, the survey was talking to Christian students at universities in the United States of America. Those students are almost entirely part of a distinct majority community wherever they live. Yes. And it's way fucking easier to claim that you'll never shout down opposing viewpoints when your viewpoints are the majority. Real easy at that point. Exactly. And also worth relevant to this discussion, by the way, that it's a clear fucking majority in every single group said that shouting down speakers was acceptable at least sometimes. And that's because it is. Yep. Right. There's an objectively correct answer here. And it's that some motherfuckers need to be shouted down. So regardless of these nonsense results, I'm still going to go on behaving as though the group that's actively banning books, outlawing history, trying to enact blasphemy laws and rising in protest every fucking time a Burger King commercial says, damn, is less committed to the principles of free speech than the side that shouts down bigotry. And finally tonight. We have two delightfully embarrassing videos from two horrible, horrible human beings. Scathing atheist regulars, Ted Cruz and Mike Lindell. (laughs) I mean, they should never talk in front of a camera. They're so bad and they know that they're so bad, but they keep doing it anyway. Now, for Lindell, he often has to be on camera as part of an ongoing legal case against him that has depositions on camera. But for Cruz, it's just him believing in his heart 
he's going to nail that next video just like a human being and talk human. And he never, <laughs> never does. So we have Mike Lindell personally imploding during legal depositions. And we have Ted Cruz attacking the concept of health guidelines for alcohol. And before you wonder, podcast listener, what Mike Lindell's deposition has to do with atheism, you have not seen these videos because they are very clearly evidence for a loving God. I'm just saying we lost everybody. <laughs> counterpoint this Hands time. up. Oh. We lost. Watch them. They make me feel the love for sure from <laughs> the God of the universe. And a big thanks to Brad and Evan for the links. Scathingnews at gmail.com. Demon free. <laughs> so, I'll start with Lindell. He just finished up a series of depositions as part of a defamation suit against him filed by Eric Coomer, the former CEO of Dominion Voting Systems. And apparently Lindell's been a raving lunatic the whole time during those depositions. Correct. So yes. <laughs> Coomer's legal team filed a motion last week to make Lindell show up in person at a Denver courthouse for the next deposition so that a judge might be able to wrangle him. He's been insane. And they released a truly wonderful highlight reel of Lindell having meltdown after meltdown after meltdown during the last deposition series. I think my favorite one was Coomer's lawyer saying, hey, I'm not talking about all the lumpy pillow complaints. And then <laughs> Lindell hearing that and proceeding to scream asshole at this lawyer for a minute straight just in <laughs> so a panic. The, the best part is he's not even calling the pillows lumpy, right? What they're doing is they're talking about a complaint line that Lindell is claiming he used to let people report election fraud right. at my pillow. Yeah. And the guy's like, isn't that supposed to be for like, I don't know, lumpy pillows? And Mike Lindell is like, I will eat the <laughs> face off your skull, you Jew. Yes. And he's like, um, he the, I'm not the, talking about those though. The fucking, the lawyer is literally just trying to come up with an offhand example of the kind of thing my pillows complaint line might get a call about. Yeah. Followed by Lindell trying to slap the guy with a glove and yeah. challenge him to a <laughs> duel. He says, you've, you've never had a my pillow. That's yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've never had a my pillow. He that's takes the pillowcase sure. off and slaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and some bonus news about Lindell because it's also great. He is completely out of money now. He went from rags to riches, but now back to rags again. And actually, now way less than rags because yeah, he's got he a owes bunch of those debt. rags. To yeah. Right? Yeah, I was gonna say his rags are getting repoed too. And I'm not even counting the. $4 billion total in lawsuits against him between Dominion and Smartmatic. Lindell was worth about $75 million when Trump took office, something like that. And now that's a negative number. Oh. During a telethon last week to help support the treasonous fake electors in Michigan, he did that. During that telethon, Lindell said, quote, they've taken me down just in a bigger way. Sick. I've had to borrow millions of dollars this summer. I've never been in debt like this for a long, long time. End quote. And then he offered to suck the telethon's dick because that's what he did the last time he was short on oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's the thing. It's literally true that supporting Trump is worse for one's finances than being addicted to crack cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's a demonstrable thing out in the world now. We got yep, data. It's true. Absolutely. And that brings us to the Phantom of the Opera. Ted Cruz heard that Dr. George Koob, the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, was considering a new set of guidelines for alcohol consumption in 2025. And that is fascism. Eventual fascism, according is to it? Ted Cruz. <laughs> Just to be clear, the current guidelines are not laws. And you, you can tell because it's a different word. Than, different words. Yeah. yeah. And they recommend that Americans limit their consumption to at most one or two drinks a day. But lots of data shows that it's better to cut that back, possibly to one or two drinks a week or zero. So Dr. Koob mentioned that fact. And Ted Cruz started La Resistance and made a defiant <laughs> protest video <laughs> against the nobody who's stopping him from drinking. He's standing in a bar somewhere in Texas in this video with 10 locals who he clearly paid just to stand behind him completely still and look like his normal, real life people friends that he definitely has. And then he grabs a bottle of beer 
that, that still has a cap on it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. just like all the bartenders serve it. And he has, <laughs> he, he's like, oh, right, takes the cap off. And then he has a spite sip. And then the piece of shit reporter from Newsmax does the same thing on the other side of the video, except with... <laughs> With a non-alcoholic beer, which fucking defeats the entire point. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I hate to say this, Heath, but if ever there was a time I thought you and Ted Cruz could come together, it was this one. So I, don't, <laughs> I don't really know. Oh, God. I want to see the outtake where Ted Cruz tried to buck the recommendations by having three beers in the course of the video. <laughs> <laughs> and just a fun little bonus before we wrap it up. I was looking for the link to the video and I searched for Ted Cruz beer on Google and the entire first page of results were something even better than what I was looking for. During a parade in Houston last year, Ted Cruz was on a float and somebody along the parade route hit him right in the fucking face with a beer can. And it's super fun to watch. I watched it's it so good. over and over. It's so good. Heath, can I give you a little bonus joy? Sure. You see the security run in and grab a guy? That was the wrong guy and he has since sued Ted Cruz who is going to settle and give him a bunch of... They just grabbed the minority. They were like, black guy, get him. <laughs> it's no. the best. That sounds about right, Houston police. It went awesome. Yikes. <laughs> All right. Well, with the promise that we will definitely link that video in the show notes, we're going to wrap up the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Also watch Ted Cruz at Yankee Stadium. It's the best. (laughs) And when we come back, you'll have missed us more than you predict. I'm just saying we can rent a house with enough bedrooms for everyone. That's not the point of bunk beds, Don. (sighs) Then what is the point of bunk beds, Heath? Friendship, Eli. Friendship and whispered secrets, Mm. obviously. Asked and answered. All right, got it. Hey, guys. Hey, you guys ready for Bible Peace Theater? Oh, you mean the part of the show where we act out the Bible so our listeners don't have to read it? (laughs) We sure are. Oh, hey, Don. When did you get here? Oh, Eli hacked into JetBlue, told me my flight was redirected, lured me onto a remote-controlled airplane, and then flew me in circles for the last week and a half until you guys needed me again. Oh, got it. Okay. Oh, that reminds me. I got to talk to you guys about a fuel bill later. Uh, where were we in the Bible, though? We'll... I had to eat a seat cushion to survive. We, we get it, Don. Yeah, so we, we've officially made it to the minor prophets. Oh, uh, like they know where coal is? Nope. Other oh, minor. So kids? No, no, like small. Nope. Like minor, small books, small miracles. And they don't get much smaller than the book we're going to start with. And that would be Hosea. Hey, hey, Hosea. God, is that you? Yeah, listen, man, I need a favor. I need you to marry a whore. Sorry, a what? You know, a a whore. A whore. Sorry, I actually don't know. Do you mean like a prostitute or divorce lady or just like a woman of ill repute in general? That's a great question. Yeah, no, scholars are not super sure what I mean by that. But either way, Mm -hmm. I'm doing like a metaphor for Israel. So, you know, just best judgment, marry a whore. Okay, just seems kind of problematic to call anyone a whore, right? Yeah. Well, it's the Bible, man. It's a bad book. Bad book, right? Yeah, got it. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblam. Apparently, she met the whore standard, and she bore him a son and two daughters. Daddy. Yes, my son. Why am I named Jezreel? Yeah, good question. So. When you were born, God told me to name you that because you're going to avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Yehu. Oh, um, wow, that's a little heavy there, Dad. (laughs) You think that's bad? Your sister's names literally translate to no mercy and not my people. They are? Yeah, yeah, sure are. Because, you see, Israel right now is like a whore to God, a dirty whore. And God says, hey, stop being such a whore or I'll tear off all your clothes and throw you in the street like garbage. A whore who will wander through the desert looking for new lovers, but wherever she looks, she'll find only thorns and hatred. It really seems like a you problem. Yep. Yep. Well, someday God will welcome her back into his arms. He will say, you are mine forever, as long as you promise never to be a whore again. Now, come have some fresh clothes and some grapes, you worthless, dirty whore. Is... Is what he'll say. That's got real bad vibes, Dad. Yeah, well, it's a bad book, son. Right, right, bad book. Yeah. Bad book. 
But apparently one sexist metaphor wasn't enough for God because soon enough he's reached out to Hosea again. Hosea, Hosea, big guy, need another <sighs> favor from you. Yen. Yeah. Okay, so I need you to go have sex with an adulteress this time. What? Why? Again, it's a metaphor for Israel. I mean, okay, but I'm married. Won't that make me an adulterer? <laughs> no, come on, funny. Those rules are only for women. Come on. <laughs> no, right. No, of course. Got it. Got it. Adulterer. Stupid. So Hosea buys himself an adulteress for 15 pieces of silver and a uh, a fucking homer and half of barley. Oh, so this is the scene with the adulteress. Well, I, I assume so, yeah. It's tricky. How's it tricky? So, like, I know we're making fun of the book, but I feel like we don't want to portray the adulteress too broadly. I mean, the book is bad. He, yeah, means, no, uh, no, I get it. The book is bad. But I feel like we don't want to contribute to the problem with, like, sex shaming or something like that. Mm. Yeah, no, that's fair. We don't want to go too broad, but we need to make it funny. Yeah, obviously. So. Oh, oh, I've got an idea. Okay, yeah, so uh, this is where you'll be staying. I like it. You go walls and floors. I put up a big um, sky and red Christmas tree. It's going to be disco, baby. Okay, didn't get a lot of that. Anyway, while you're here, please only have sex with me. Um, it's a metaphor for God and Israel. Manipur, no problem, village golem. Cool. You want me to crack your heart juice? Maybe crank what? your haunch? No, no, none of that, I, I don't think. Uh, actually, I'm going to go. So Okay, but you let me know when you want to get your grinkle scrunched, okay? okay? No, no, thank you, though. No. Scrunched. No. Scrunched real good. Backing out. So with that out of the way, God makes a big angry speech to Israel. For how long? Uh, the rest of the fucking book. Oh, so like a, a big angry speech. Yeah, no, it's a long one. All right, everybody, gather round. You know the drill. I see all the tribes of Israel are here. So first of all, I just want to say I'm pissed at you guys. You all suck. And I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't usually like to name names, but I just want to say Ephraim, okay? Tribe of Ephraim, you guys Absolutely screwed the pooch lately. Like, I'm amazed at how much you guys suck right now. Uh, oh. suck, I guess. Anyway, where was I? Uh, let's see. You're, you're all going to die, obviously. No water, no food. Pretty standard. I've said that before. Oh, God. Also, fuck Ephraim. Like, specifically, fuck you guys. I saw you fucking around with idols and like, God, you're just the fucking worst and I hate you. It's just, I hate you. Feels a little... Directed. Continuing. Mothers will die with their children. I'll be the lion that eats your face. Fuck Ephraim. You guys are the worst and nobody cares about you. Okay, we get it. Do you, Ephraim? Do you? Ephraim? I mean, yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't think you do. And that is the book of Hosea. Oh, shit. That's been like seven minutes a little short this week uh don what was your favorite part of the pajama party oh that's a good question uh, no, um no no Eli, we don't have to uh, ask don's opinion oh. about anything all the minor profits are short so we can just move right on to joel oh thank god okay so what's joel about well it's another big yelly speech nice got it i enjoyed dinner at franchette don please <sighs> Hey, everybody, it's me again, coming at you through Joel this time. First off, just want to apologize to Ephraim for the end of that last book. That was just extremely targeted. I do not know what was going on with me. I think I might have hypoglycemia, but yeah, my bad. Anyway, let's see. Uh, everyone needs to wake up. Uh, you're all a bunch of drunks, and I'm going to take away your wine. Wait, is he serious? I'll burn your fields. I'll kill your animals. Oh, oh, this is a new one. I'm going to perplex your cows. Mm -hmm. Like that. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, palmer worms. What the palmer worms haven't eaten, the locusts have. And what the locusts don't eat, the canker worms will. What the canker worms don't eat, the caterpillars are going to eat. I just, I feel like you could have just said the worms will eat everything. Well, I didn't. Anyway. The fire will burn everything and everyone's faces are going to be all black. Like in the Canadian Prime Minister way? No, Justin, in the burned way. In the uh, burned way. Okay, but what about the wine, though? 
thing you said about the wine? Also, beasts of the field. And I know I don't talk to you guys a lot because you're animals. Moving right past it? I don't want you to be afraid. Feels weird that I'm sort of comforting you in this moment out loud in the Bible, but I feel like you guys have gotten kind of a bum rap in this book, and I just want you to know that this time, you're going to be fine. Momo. You're welcome, beasts of the field. Anyway, people sell my people and buy them, so I'm going to sell and buy you. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Oh, also, everyone make your plows into swords. Feels like that's going to be tricky. Yeah, well, do it. Oh, also, I'm going to cover the mountains with wine and the hills with milk. Nice, the wine's back. Yeah, and so that just about wraps it up. Let me see. Oh, uh, uh, ooga booga, I'm God. And that's Joel. Nice, two for two. Okay, we're on a roll. What's next? Uh, Amos. Oh, I've heard of him. Oh, you have? Sure, he's famous. At two, Morgan. Anyways, what's this one about? Uh, Well, it's... uh. Another big yelly speech from God. Another big yelly speech from God. Another big yelly speech from God. All right, everyone, here we go. First off, few places I'm going to destroy for three things and also four things. What? Sorry, three and four? What? Yes, three and four things. So, seven? Nope. I can see why you'd think that. Yeah. It is three things and also four things. Okay, why is this in the Bible? Also, also I'm mad because sometimes a father and son are having sex with the same woman. I've heard that's oh, happening. Some people are into that. Well, they shouldn't be, Heath Enright, the podcaster. Keep shaming. Also, quick reminder. Really specific. This book has giants in it and I killed them. Oh, hey, I've also got a message. I'm talking to the animals. The fat cows of Samaria. No. Mm-hmm. I know, I'm back on the other side again. Real complex relationship with cows this week. Anyways, you oppress the poor. I don't want to hear it, okay? I don't know what to do about you people. I gave you the plague and pestilence. I sold your children into slavery. I killed you with swords. And you guys still aren't loyal. I mean, what's it going to take here? Well, maybe try not doing all of that. Nope, I don't think it's that. I think I need to kill you some more. Also, for the record, I hate feats... And musicians. What? And people who drink wines out of bowls. Well, you got to drink it out of something. Well, you're not, because I'm going to kill all of you dead, and then and then you'll drink wine. Well, that's a weird turn. I liked it. I like the turn. And that's Amos. Okay. Uh, what's next? Obadiah. And yeah, literally one chapter of God yelling. Come on, guys, we're like four minor prophets in and nothing has happened. I, I didn't write the Bible. Well, sometimes it feels like you did, no illusions. Who's next? Uh, Jonah. The whale guy. The, yeah, the whale guy. Nice. Now that is what I'm talking about. Jonah. Hey, hey, Jonah. God? That's right. How you doing, man? So you read the last few books. I just need you to go to a city called uh, Nineveh? 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 Yeah, Nineveh. And yell at them about how awesome I am. Right? Right? Uh, no. Sorry, what? Yeah, thanks for the offer, I guess. Uh, but you, you, you tend to just destroy cities anyway. The message is kind of the same. I, I'm going to pass. You, you can't pass. I'm God. And, and yet here I am, pa- passing. See ya. J- Jonah. J- Jonah from the Bible, do not walk away from me. I don't even know how you're walking away from me since I'm omnipresent, but don't you do it. But walk away he does, and he boards a ship for Tarshish. But no sooner is he out to sea than God sends a terrible storm to trouble the boat. Hey, Captain, what's going on up here? No idea. Terrible storm whipped up. We've been throwing stuff overboard all day to please the gods, but no dice. Ah, are you sure it's the gods? Oh, yes, uh, this is definitely a god storm, trust me. I found the lots, sir. Sorry, sorry, the lots? Oh, I. we're going to cast lots and figure out what pissed off the gods. I, I don't think we need to do all that. And it's Jonah, it's Jonah, Jonah pissed off the gods. Dude, seriously? Yeah, sorry, I probably should have mentioned that. Uh, but God's mad at me. He asked me to do a prophet thing, and I passed. You, you 
you can't pass, he's gone. Uh, exactly. Well, yeah, and yet here I am, having passed. Okay, why did you not mention this before we when, set sail? When, when was I going to mention it? After you gave the little demonstration about where the life vests are? I mean, that would have been nice. Guys, guys, what do we do? Well, I mean, I guess you should probably throw me overboard. Hmm. Do you think that'll work? But I, I have no idea. You're the one that was talking about throwing shit overboard. That was your plan. Ah, all right. Okay, okay, fine. Here we go. Wait, 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 wait. One, 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 one second. One second. What? Let, let me take off my shoes first. <sighs> okay, fine. Here we go. All right, wait, wait, wait. Ah! So they throw Jonah overboard and he's swallowed by a giant fish. Wait, wait, wait. I thought this story was about a whale. Uh, it is. The Bible thinks whales are fish. Of course they do. Sure. So he stays there for three days and three nights until finally he begins to pray. All right, here we go. Uh, God, I get your message uh, with the whole fish thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's starting to smell in here and uh, well, everything kind of became the pee corner at once. So I'm, I'm sorry, but and if you let me go, I will tell everyone in Nineveh to be scared of you. You heard him, Fishy. Dude, did you just get vomited up by a giant fish? Oh, that's nothing. I used to live in a Manhattan apartment. Thank you, Morgan. And that's why you should all repent super hard. Wow. Incredible. I don't know, Jonah. That's an amazing story. But what's this god of yours going to do if we don't repent? Well, I mean, he fed me to a fish for three days just for not wanting to be here. He's got a point. Yeah, let's repent. I repent. Very good point. I'm going to go wrap my cat in sackcloth. Uh, so all the people of Nineveh and their animals, for some reason, fast, repent, and dress themselves in sackcloth, uh, which does not please Jonah at all. Hey, God. God? Oh, hey, Jonah. What's up, buddy? I I'm kind of in the middle of taking a mug shot here. Oh, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I told everybody in the city to repent because you were going to destroy them, and n now you haven't, and... Well, and they all think I'm a liar. Well, I mean, everyone did the sackcloth thing, so I changed my mind. Okay, but... But God changed his mind is a wild supposition because, you know, you're, you're omniscient. I mean, they even did the animals, though, dude. Did you see the cats? I did. I did. <laughs> With the little sackcloth hats. It was adorable. And but, but, but still, you, you kind of made me look like an asshole. I understand. I understand. Let me help you out here. Take a look at this. Isn't this a nice gourd plant? Huh? Nice and shady? I mean... Right? Yeah, actually, the shade is kind of nice. Kaboom! Hey, what did you do that for? See? Nineveh is just like that. Why would I destroy something good for no reason? Aren't you the guy who invented baby cancer? Eh, try not to think too hard about it. Sure. Sure. And that's the book of Jonah, and as far as we're getting tonight, but there are still more pointless Old Testament storylets to come on next month's Bible Peace Theater. <laughs> It's time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. This is the part of the show that nestles in between the C segment and the outro, just like a corgi squeezing onto a full couch. <laughs> <laughs> Legs. Our first message comes from Lewis, who asks, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? You used to be funny. <laughs> he seems fun. Huh. Now, now, wait. He didn't say we aren't funny anymore. Maybe he still thinks we're funny, and he's just doing like a health and wellness check-in. Oh, it could be right? that. He's worried. Yeah. Okay. For us? No, sorry, Lewis. Once the checks from Big Woke started rolling in, we couldn't turn back. I mean, there's yeah, just obviously, much... yeah. You could write us a bigger check, but I can't imagine that you have much money. So you don't <laughs> statistically. Well, yeah. So to be clear, <laughs> Lewis didn't offer up any details beyond what what we just read. But I get the feeling he's complaining about the lack of fucking transphobia or sexism or guaranteed. something. Yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, right. guaranteed. Always, it's, a it's thing. what it always is. And, and so, yeah. In, in all seriousness, dude, there are fucking plenty of shows for you. 
right? Almost the entirety of entertainment history is replete with jokes at the expense of minorities for people just like you. The fact that you begrudge one fucking podcast trying to be inclusive betrays a stunning assumption of privilege. So fuck off. Yeah. Sorry, just real quick. I'm looking through his email for any like, you know, really good jokes that might fit here, make the show funny again. You guys come back to me. I'll, I'll let you know if I, if I find any uh, Bon Mo from Lewis. <laughs> All right, so we also got a few messages from listeners who have expressed concerns about our newest sponsor over on GAM, DraftKings Sportsbook. Yeah. Oh, I found one. Nope, nope. It was a slur word. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when our first DraftKings ad came out a few weeks ago, a few of you really politely, and a couple of you not so politely, expressed your concern about us working with them. And we actually put a lot of thought into what advertisers we choose to work with, which is why we don't have that sweet, sweet CBD money, but we thought we might alleviate some of the worries that we've seen expressed. Right. Yeah. So, so first and foremost, a few of you were uncomfortable with us just being associated with gambling, like at all. And while we can understand people's concerns about gambling addiction, our audience are adults. Uh, the vast majority of adults game responsibly. You know, this is also why we chose to advertise alcohol on the show in spite of the fact that some people are alcoholics, like some of the listeners that we know are recovered alcoholics. And, 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 and those ads don't even include a minute and a half of disclaimers about what to do if you have a drinking problem, right? Yeah. Also keep in mind that DraftKings and other sites like it are a significantly safer way to bet on sports than has ever existed in the past. Like when I was a bartender back in the, <laughs> the fucking days of yore, I used to hand just a wad of cash from my tip jar that day to this guy who looked like a manatee in a leather jacket and he'd like <laughs> scribble something down on a napkin. Right, yes. I don't even think he knew how to write. He would just like fake mime scribble something and be like, yeah, I got your bet. And then I would just hope some money would come back if I won my bets. Right, yeah. And you used to have to like bet on sports on gray or black market websites, which many times would just Take your money. And not only is DraftKings a legitimate gambling website, but they go out of their way to discourage problem gambling, right? They have limits on the size of the bets that you can make. They have limits on how long you can spend on their app, the kind of bets they'll take, et cetera, et cetera. All of which we should point out cost them money, but keep their customers safer. Right. And if you want to learn more about those steps, you don't have to take our word for it. You can read more about it on DKSaferPlay.com. That's DKSaferPlay.com. I'll have it uh, linked on the show notes as well. And look, we're, we're big boys. We can take a criticizing comment here or there. See how cool we were when Lewis didn't call us funny? But when <laughs> stuff comes up like this, it's, it's worth reminding you that like, this is how we make our living, right? We, we don't hide our show behind a paywall. We don't play auto ads every four and a half seconds, unlike some podcasts, me. And we go out of our way to advertise responsibly, right? We had a very lucrative ad spot with a VPN, but they had bullshit in their copy, so we cut it. We had an offer to advertise for lab-made, independently tested CBT, but we knew that a lot of the claims associated with CBD were bullshit, so we didn't take it. So when we do make a decision like this, please know that we've, we have actually put considerable thought into it on your behalf. Yeah, yeah. And uh, last but not least, we got a message from listener Noah L who says, I think you guys are really funny and I love the advertising choices that you make. Great job, guys. <laughs> nice. Also, if I wanted to see you live, say around the end of October, where would be a good place to do that? Okay, well, you are in luck, listener Noah L. We're doing a live show in Las Vegas, Nevada on October 28th, and we even have some VIP tickets left available, I think couple of Iridium tickets, too. So head Ooh. over to godawfulmovieslive.com for more info. And that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending us those emails, tweets, and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Before we lower the mic gently to the floor, dropping them is for people who don't have to pay for them, I want to remind everybody that there's a link to those tickets Heath was talking about on the show notes. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our Sister Show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our Half Sister Show Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't wear my podcaster name tag with pride if I don't thank Heath Enright for nerding out with me about opening week. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for putting up with Heath and I nerding out about opening week. I want to thank Lucinda Lusions for way more putting up 
with me nerding out about opening week than I would dare to subject Eli to. Also want to thank Canada's very own Jordan for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And he asked me that we use this space to let you know that you can pick up your copy of the children's book, Ralph the Flying Hedgehog and the Magical Red Rain Jacket by following the link on the show notes. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Evan, Phil, Genevieve, Samantha, Joshua, Josh, Rain, Tyler, RJ, Nate, Ryan, Word of the Broad, Scott, Blunt Force, Llama, Lori, Logan, L, Jason, JCH, Michael, Dalton, Whitney, and Shelly Belly Jellybean, who are so bright the UV protection on their sunglasses has to go both ways. Together, these 23 people, initials, delightful rhymes, and top-notch llama puns ensured we'd have the power to record another one of these things next week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but nobody gets your money without fighting you for it, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling your friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. I feel like Lindell's stress is going to get repoed. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. Tin Man Heating and Cooling has been providing quality HVAC solutions in the area for over 30 years. We have the proper training, resources, tools, and experience to serve all makes and models. You shouldn't have to choose between your comfort and your bank account. That's why Tin Man Heating and Cooling has up to a 10-year warranty on your new system with a 100% satisfaction guarantee for all your heating and cooling replacement or repair needs. Call Tin Man Heating and Cooling or go to tinmanheating.com. 